You are now watching Believe. Do you believe? We're back here on Serralo Sports Talk. And joining me now on the show, he is not only a Super Bowl 42 champion, but he is the Super Bowl 42 hero. It is New York Giants legend, David Tyree. David, thanks so much for joining the show. Oh, man, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me, bud. Of course. You know, this is absolutely incredible for me. You know, I mentioned it to you, of course, before we started recording this, that I was nine years old when Super Bowl 42 took place. So you are single-handedly responsible for most, I would say, of my childhood joy as a New York sports fan, man. So again, thanks for taking the time to come on. Now, you're here with a fantastic cause. You're here with the NFL's Fatherhood Festival. This will be taking place next weekend, Father's Day weekend, in Canton, Ohio at the NFL Hall of Fame Village. Tell us a little bit about this great cause and what you're looking to accomplish along with several other NFL legends next weekend. Well, man, I'm, I'm really excited about the entire weekend. It's a weekend that's truly built around families. It's a weekend, of course, built for impact, but it's experiential. It's immersive. Um, you know, Jordan Davis, country singers, of course, tons of former and maybe even a possible couple of, you know, current uh, NFL athletes. But it's really just about the family and the centerpiece of that, how, how meaningful that is and the role that the father can play and, uh, and, and continue to bring impact to that family unit and stability. So I'm a father of seven. I obviously got some experience and uh, <laughs> definitely put my work in. And I'm excited to not just be a part of, but a participant. I mean, you know, David, right there, I've got to stop and ask, how do you balance being a father of seven with being an NFL player? I mean, how many kids did you have while you were in the league? That, that sounds like it's a challenge, man. Yeah, I think when my last season in the NFL, my fifth child was born. So I had, you know, actually right after I retired, he was born or right as I retired. So, you know, I had a couple couple more after maybe a little too much time on my hands, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and, and we, we bottomed out at seven. And honestly, there, balance is something that I think um, I call it. It's, it's real, but it's a little overrated. And I think that we have to be responsible. We have to be, you know, um, ferocious in our goals. And I think when we have the right intents and motives, everything settles in a way where you actually have some contentment in life. So our, our, my family's a huge priority, but of course I'm working to ensure that they have the greatest experience um, that life would afford them. Well, you know, you talk about being ferocious with your goals and you seem like a real goal oriented person. You've got a lot of things in the works right now. And one of them is your new show, the Catch the Moment podcast. I believe you just dropped episode eight this morning, right? I did. We actually, it was just a solo episode, uh, just giving these guys some wisdom on transition. It was a fun one, a little shorter. You know, our interviews get a little long, but um, they're awesome. Just great guests, great content, and taking everybody through with the process, the journey and the pain points that delivers everybody to their moment of success. Yeah, so exactly. Dive a little more into that, into that show of yours. What exactly, you know, about the journey are you looking to relay to the audience? What are you looking to really get out of this and how are you looking to change people's lives by them tuning in? Yeah, I think we, we have to normalize some difficulties, right? We have to normalize adversity in a way where when it comes, we're not shocked by it. We're actually prepared and fueled to overcome that hurdle. And I think that any person who has achieved something significant and I think success is all, always subjective or even had that moment of success, there's been some adversity, there's been some pain points um, you know, whether it's looking for a, a new assistant, that's a pain point. Whether it's looking for a new employee, it's a pain point. So what, a, what you know, I think we want to unearth the, the journey in a way where we can value the, the experience that delivers us to our goals, our in place that will bring us that measure of satisfaction and make it all worth it. Well, David, you know what it's like to really step up uh, when you're least expecting it. We'll get to the catch in just a minute, but I do want to remind everyone that this is Super Bowl 42 hero David Tyree joining me on Serralo Sports Talk. And this interview is brought to you by our terrific partners at Bet Online. Bet Online continues to be the number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. And if you head over to their website or their mobile app today, sign up using the code BLEAV, that's B L E A V, for your incredible 50% welcome bonus. Now, David, let's get to the catch uh, because you know, without that catch, my childhood is substantially worse. So <laughs> if you'll allow me, you know, truthfully speaking, when I think of that catch, I think that just as impressive as your catch itself was Eli breaking, what was it, three sacks just yes. to get that ball <laughs> off. Now, as that thing is wobbling your way in midair, I have to know what's going through your mind. 
I got to have it. You know, so of course, any Giants fan knows that my opportunities were few and far as an all pro special teamer, but I had to fight and claw for every little opportunity I got, every crumb. I only had four catches during the regular season that year. So that's my mind. You know, I was always prepared because I knew I would have few opportunities. And, you know, that was really it. You know, he gave me the opportunity. I'm locked in on it. It was literally like a lock it, like a torpedo system locking in. And I mentally prepared myself for some, for some, you know, for, for some contact. So I, that I didn't know the ball was on my head, but I definitely knew I caught it. And, you know, it, it was something that paid off well for both of us. Yeah, I love that. Some contact. That's pretty modest right there. Uh, <laughs> was that not blatant pass interference on Rodney? I mean, if you don't make that catch, do you think it gets called? I'll be honest with you. I don't know. I think it was probably played as best as you could play football. He got there almost synonymous, synonymously is when the ball got there, as far as what I can remember. And I think that's what makes it so amazing is everything was done the right way for that play not to happen. I mean, like for that, from start to finish, the offensive lineman blocked no one. <laughs> Eli is probably the most sackable quarterback in the NFL. <laughs> and I'm the least likely guy to be tossed up in the fourth quarter. And I got a 31-inch vert. I'm the black man who can't jump. <laughs> <laughs> Holy <laughs> crap, man. I have a better vertical than that. You, you do. Like, everybody does. It's fantastic. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's, like I said, that's what these moments are made for. It's, uh, it's definitely a made-for-movie moment. I was glad to be a recipient of something that was so far beyond me that means so much to so many people. Yeah, it, it was absolutely incredible. Hey, now, what about later on that drive? Uh, I mean, you know, you, you told me what's going through your mind when the ball's in the air headed your way. What about, forget when, when the catch is made, but when you see Plaxico in no man's land, in the end zone. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, were you able to contain yourself or what's going on in that moment, man? Everything, you know, like this, this couldn't be like, you, you're partially like, this is happening and then it's not happened until it's all, until it's over. Right. Mm -hmm. the, so I think in my head is we fully expected to execute. We executed. I couldn't believe I had the role that I have and I didn't see the play until I actually got back to the hotel. So I just knew I made the biggest catch in my moment, but until the game's over, there's nothing like, and then Tom Brady is heaving the ball down the field. So, I mean, those were like three, three, four terrifying throws. Yeah. Yes. After the Jay Alford sack, it was like, ah, oh! you know, so, <laughs> I mean, honestly, we, we felt like we were a team that were built for that moment, built to take down the one of the greatest teams the NFL has ever seen. And like I said, I was, I was amazed and fortunate, blessed by God, to have a role in it. Absolutely, man. You know, I, I've spent a lot of time rewatching games from that season, talking to people about that season. About three years ago, I, I uh, had one of my favorite interviews, sat down with Bob Papa and David Deal simultaneously. And they told me about that bus ride uh, or rather the bus rides all week in London when you guys were playing the Dolphins, how the team yes. really came together. But week 17, when New England beats us 38-35, did you know in that moment after playing them tougher than anyone had all season, did you know if we see these guys again, we're going we're gonna to do the job? I certainly had all the belief in the world. You know, like it was bone crushing that we didn't win that game. Mm -hmm. In our mind, you know, from start to finish, we just knew we had it. And I think they were really that good. You know, the Randy Moss play at the end of the game, they were just really that good. And it was bone crushing that we didn't get it. Our skipper set us up. We said, we're going to play this game. Everybody's up. And that's what we wanted. And I think it definitely positioned us. It didn't deflate us. It positioned us because we knew that we had the resolve to go on the road and take down those teams. And it was just really about executing. Us, we, we had a dynamic team from from top to bottom. Everything's perfect in in in, in hindsight, but from the from the leadership to the to the emerging figures, that rookie draft class, and the role players, it was all about the synergy that we were developing from start to finish. And, and you know, going into that Week 17 game, look, I'll just say off the bat, I've defended Tom Coughlin my entire life. I think he's one of the greatest head coaches ever in the yeah, NFL. Yeah. And I noticed, you know, even with this interview, you were two minutes early and you know, that's Coughlin. If you're not early, you're late. And uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of guys in Jacksonville complain about him. Oh, he's too much of a hard ass, too much of a disciplinarian. It's football. That, that's yeah. what you need. And were you guys surprised? What was your reaction when you found out despite having the playoff, you know, position locked up, what was your reaction when you found out starters were going in that week 17 game? He took a lot of criticism for that. Real dogs want to eat. You know, real dogs want to eat. And I think that's that was our reaction. 
I don't think we were surprised because we began to understand who our coach was. And when I think about, and I understand there's every situation is not the same, but you play games, games are played to win. We know that there's a lot of learning lessons. You know, every game that you play, whether it's Twister, whether it's Monopoly, or of course, something as strategic and amazing as football, the whole object of the game is to win it. So, you know, we can get into all of our data analytics and semantics and every other way that there's, you know, useful decisions to be made. But this was one of those easy decisions for us and the character of our team and what we wanted to have. And we wanted to take out the best team that the National Football League had that year. We missed the mark there, but we got to win it counted. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'd rather win the Super Bowl than win that week 17 game any day of the week. <laughs> hey, I want to ask you about the following season. Now, I know that 2008 for you personally was not a great year. You were injured, missed the season. But I, I want to ask about that Giants team because mm -hmm. I've been told on the record from other guys who played in the league that the 2008 Giants, despite winning Super Bowl 42 the year before, 46, three years later, I've been told the 08 Giants were the best Giants team, was the best Giants team, rather, that a lot of these guys have ever faced. And, you know, I, I, I need you to keep it real with me here, man. If Plaxico, if that whole situation doesn't go down, if he doesn't shoot himself and miss the rest of the season, are the Giants the most recent team, not the 03, 04 Patriots, to repeat? I, I, would, I would have to say absolutely. Mm -hmm. I can remember, and obviously I missed the whole season, so I'm looking from the outside in, and I'm, I'm in and around, but it's definitely not the same when you're in that position. But I remember the Baltimore Ravens game, and this is a slugfest. These are two teams that are built like each other, and we gave the Ravens the business. <laughs> and that's, I'm talking about, you know, that's the game where you're, when you're measuring who you are and are from, from, from every area. It was a physical game. It was everything that you expected, but we gave them the business, got the W. And that's, like, I'm like, man, these guys, these guys, they're on. The belief was there. There was no question about our ability to execute. It was just unfortunate that, you know, the incidents occur and they couldn't seal the deal. Yeah, I mean, that team was just, and you know, you talk about 07, a lot of people highlight the defense, of course. Yeah. 08, I mean, that offense was zooming. That team just was clicking on all cylinders. It was, uh, you know, didn't miss a beat after Strahan retired. It, uh, it really would have been something to see that team at full health come the postseason. Hey, you know, you're one of the few guys around that locker room who was there pre-Eli and got to watch him not only develop, but also Blossom. You were there pre-Eli, won a Super Bowl with Eli. Not too many guys. I mean, who? You, Amani. Uh, not yeah. too many guys can say that. Yes. What was watching that development like for you up close? It was painful the first couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> it was painful because I think my third season was when I, and I was his second se season was when I won the third wide receiver position out of training camp. And, you know, and it, chemistry and the clicking just wasn't there. He just hadn't, got quite there and he was all, the talent wasn't the issue it was just chemistry uh and belief I think you know like and and I think it was a lot of different factors in my personal opinion he was the guy for the for the Giants franchise to accomplish what he did you know and but my personal opinion also he he needed some of those pillars in place to to reach his full potential he needed that strong offensive line to be in his place he wasn't a guy that could just immediately shift the trajectory and change everything about it. It was, he was the guy for a really solid Giants football team. He was the guy that New York City when cave, cave his, his sense of productivity and identity. And that's the amazing part about him. But he did blossom as the right tools were put in place. He, he absolutely did. You know, David, I, I could continue this conversation for days, but we've got to wrap this up. I know you're a busy man. Thank you so much for your time for joining the show. Appreciate you for having me, Chip. Super Bowl 42 hero David Tyree will be back on this episode of Serralo Sports Talk with my final word. Let's go. Thank you for watching Believe. You can find more great content at Believe.com. That's B-L-E-A-V.com. Do you believe?